Hello, Mr. Editor. It is I, Svaldrick Borgensen, renowned guy. I figured that we would add in some mysterious music when I talk. But I've left the end product up to you, for I am not long for this world. That being said, the most important thing to understand is that this recording is not for you. It has never been for you. I record myself because I like to hear myself talk. I want you to know that some of the things I'm going to say may alarm or even frighten you. You may also develop schizophrenia and imagine that I exist. These are totally natural responses, which is why you should shut this recording off now. But since I've definitely piqued your interest, I'm just kidding. Keep listening. So, yeah, I think we're just leaving it all in. Like this right now, what we're doing, this stays in. So I think I'm just going to kick it off instead of uh, our traditional opening. I don't even know if we should say it's words about books. This is words about words about words about words about words about a book. That's accurate. Inside of a book, inside of a book, inside of a book. (laughs) I'm just going to kick this off like trailer style. In a world where a guy wrote way too much. Here, here, oh, are, some, you here are some quotes. Here are some quotes about House of Leaves. This is how I'm going to start this off. Funny. Moving. Sexy. Beautifully told. An elaborate engagement with the shape and meaning of narrative. The New York Times book review. How much, how much of the book did you read? A rollicking, pinchonesque oddity a Nabokovian linguistic obsession, and a Borgesian unreality. House of Leaves jumps and skips and plays with genre-wrecking abandon, postmodern panache, and an obsessively imaginative scope that absolutely shames most books on the market today. San Francisco Examiner and Chronicle. House of Leaves isn't one of those tidy little things that holds your hand and wipes your bottom and tells you that you're special. It makes you work, and what you get out of it depends largely on how much work you're willing to do. House of Leaves is difficult at times, incredibly complex, occasionally pretentious, and, view spoiler, it doesn't neatly wrap up some of the biggest questions it raises. Will Wheaton. One of the most ambitious, complicated, and eagerly anticipated literary debuts of the year, House of Leaves is like no other novel you've read. Totally infuriating. It made me feel dumb, bored, and annoyed all at once. If I want that, I'll date my first boyfriend again. (laughs) A love story by a semiotician. Daniel Lewski has a songwriter's heart as attuned to heartache as he is to Derrida's theory on the sign. I have no idea whether it's on purpose or not. Sometimes I'm certain it is. Other times I'm certain it's just one big fucking train wreck. Johnny Truant, House of Leaves. Get the fuck out of (laughs) here. Before I understood the significance of things like auditory hallucination, verbigeration, Word salad, derealization, depersonalization. I sensed in them all kinds of adventure. To reach their meaning would require a great journey, which I eventually found out was in fact true, though the destinations didn't exactly turn out to be Edenic places full of gold leaf, opal, or intricately carved pieces of jade. Yeah, uh, none of those things sound like fun things to have, Johnny. I don't know why you would think that they would be. 1990. My father was the head of the USC School of Theater. I was living in New York. Then I got the phone call. The, Mark, your father is dying of cancer phone call. He was in the hospital, renal failure, 
cancer. I got on a Greyhound bus headed west. Over the course of three sleepless nights and three sleepless days, I wrote a hundred plus page piece entitled Redwood. I remember using a fountain pen. I barely had the change to buy sodas and snacks along the way, and there I am, scratching out the words with this absurdly expensive thing of polished resin and gold. I'd like to say it was a pelican, but I don't think that's correct. Another thing I seem to remember, the paper I was writing on had a pale blue cast to it. There was also something about how the pen seemed to bite into the paper at the same time as it produced these lush sweeps of ink, kind of cutting and spilling, almost as if a page could bleed. My intention had been to present this piece of writing as a gift to my father. As has been mentioned many times before, my father responded with the suggestion that I pursue a career in the post office. I responded by reducing the manuscript to confetti, going so far as to throw myself a pity parade in the nearby dumpster. My sister responded by returning later to that dumpster, rescuing the confetti, and taping it all back together. But there's also a hidden code in that, where he capitalized a bunch of letters. What does it say, Ben? It says that this is a book written by a man who thinks the appropriate gift for somebody dying in the hospital of renal failure is a hundred plus page unedited handwritten manuscript written on the bus on the way there. That's what we're talking about today. <laughs> we're talking about a book written by that guy. I debated how harsh I should be, but there's just something about Mark Danielewski's writing that you need to understand going into this. And and I think it's going to be divisive because you're either going to absolutely love this or absolutely hate this. And I yeah. think whether or not you love this or hate this is going to depend on whether you think that joke I just made is the most offensive thing you've ever heard <laughs> or <laughs> you think it's it's genuinely kind of funny because... It's mean to say, and I don't think anybody like having their dream shattered by their dad is is good or funny, but there is just something about the way this man talks about writing for writing's sake, just the act of writing, just the the sheer thrill of writing words, putting words on a page. Somebody the later in the interview that I was taking this quote from, they ask him what the story Redwood was about, and he responds, Lush sweeps of ink. And that's what we're <laughs> it's dealing not with not the here. story that matters. And, oh, I'm starting to see a pattern here. You seem to kind of give this like an average score. I gave it a below average score. I didn't like this book. I was the one who suggested we read it. I was actually, I was actually pumped up for it. So if, if you're someone who just loves House of Leaves and you can't stand people criticizing it now's the time to probably <laughs> shut it off um when we if we talk about and i probably will uh if you are one of those fans who likes it that's fine i'm not attacking you if you're one of those fans that's like will wheaton and reading this book <laughs> made you <laughs> some sort of super genius who makes you better than other people because you could pay attention and focus and not everyone could do that then yeah this kind of is kind of just a bit directed at you just a little bit i think i can i'm going to take the stance that this is a good book that isn't for me I would take the stance of this was a good book that wasn't for me, and then it just kept going forever, and it, <laughs> it rapidly became not a good book. About 400 pages of this was a good book that wasn't yeah, for me, and then yeah, about 200 pages of this was self-indulgent bullshit. A lot, a lot of what we said, and especially in the first season of Words About Books, was this could have been trimmed down and it would have been better. For, for almost every book, that was true, except for like Agatha Christie, who made basically the opposite of House of Leaves. <laughs> she had only 200 pages to work with and like every page counted. House of Leaves feels like it's a solid 250 to 350 page book. And then he added another 500 pages just to add 500 pages. I get the point. I understand 
do we need the other 500 pages? I think, and I think, I guess the purpose was he to said, make his point, don't do. read this. And it's like, okay, I'm, I'm in, I'm into the not reading this thing. You got me. I, you <laughs> hit my breaking point. You hit my breaking point. I understand none of it matters. Goodbye. <laughs> I think the point he's trying to make does require all these extra pages. I think it's fair that these extra pages are there. I think we need to talk about real quick what House of Leaves is and what House of Leaves isn't. What House of Leaves definitely is not is a traditional narrative. There's a lot of fancy words from fancy people on the back trying to tell you what that is. I'm assuming um, the average American does not know uh, what Pinchonesque, Nabokovian, or Borgesian are meant to mean, and I don't think that makes you less of an intellectual. I do think there is a lot, 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 lot of pretension around this book. The author himself pointed it out, but intentionally being pretentious is still pretentious. House of Leaves presents itself, or at least it has this reputation. It doesn't present itself as really anything other than what it is. I will give it that. But it has a reputation as being this book of layered meanings that has all these like hidden narratives and secrets. Puzzles. That, and, yeah. Yeah. The words are written in a different way. These words are mirrored for some reason. There's, a, yeah. there's an X on this one. Every instance of the word house is in blue. What does it mean? And what it what it is is actually a statement on kind of postmodernist thinking about objective realities and objective centers of things from which you can view the whole and the idea that uh, there is an objective reality. I think House of Leaves exists to question the notion of objective reality. I think that the author does not answer questions about the book because he doesn't want like his interpretation of the book is not what he views as the correct interpretation of the book yeah he doesn't answer questions because he doesn't have answers to the questions well because there are no answers because yes, there is no that's the point truth yeah that's the there's point. no reward waiting for you at the end of the book no matter how much work you put into it, Will. <laughs> well, unless this is the first time you've ever been exposed to that sort of idea. I, I, I want to go on record and say I don't even dislike Will Wheaton, but that review really rubbed me the wrong way. I know you don't like him. <laughs> Postmodernism is a weird thing because it's gotten a lot of attention recently from like the joe rogan crowd i don't know how aware you are of this no nope. but <laughs> there's basically uh, there was the enlightenment movement where they embraced rationality atheism basically observation analysis conclusion and then there was a postmodernist movement that said that our observations are not objective and therefore some of the assumptions we make from them, the conclusions we draw from them, can be called into question. And I think that's that's by and large a good thing. That's because fair I, in some cases. Yeah, I do think, like, I'll, I'll give the example of artificial intelligence machine learning. Simply calling these things machine learning anthropomorphizes what's going on to an unhelpful degree sometimes, I think. In that the machine is not learning, the machine is not intelligent, or at least it's not learning and intelligent in the way we traditionally use those words. It's not aware of itself. It's not aware that it has learned a fact about the world. It's not aware of the world. And that affects what we expect from it. I think we expect too much when we say we have a really good machine learning algorithm. And it's little things like that. It, it adds up. I don't want to do a whole thesis on like postmodernism as it relates to like objective observation or anything like that. But my point is, if this is the first time you encountered that idea that, hey, maybe reality isn't objective. Hey, maybe our perception of what we think of as objective facts is actually influenced by our biases. That's a neat idea. And if this is how you first encounter it, I bet that blows your mind. I remember the first time I started encountering some of this stuff. Um, 
and you know sadly for me it was like anime and <laughs> comic books and whatever but this is this is probably a more intellectual way to come to these realizations but if if you're a 34 year old adult as i am and some guys like what if the book is the labyrinth <gasps> oh my god so house of leaves is not a traditional narrative house of leaves is a myriad of narratives with i'd say three main narratives the three main narratives i would say are the narrative of the navidson record yep which is a movie that never existed that was my favorite part that's it's a movie that never existed being written about by a blind poet called zampano yeah that's how i said i don't no, know no. we're calling him zampano we're moving on that's his name now if it wasn't before it is now Okay, so Zampano's writing about this movie called The Navidson Record. In The Navidson Record, a family moves into a house, and the house winds up, they notice, is bigger on the inside than the outside by like a quarter of an inch. And then it gets weirder. Is that why the front of the book is a quarter of an inch? That is correct. Oh, wow. Yeah, see? See what he did there? That solved the mystery. So that... The house uh, develops a hallway that leads into an ever-changing, ever-growing labyrinth that the family explores to their eventual destruction. That's one narrative. But that's not true. Doesn't Whatever. The family gets brought together at the end, and they all live happily ever after. Yeah. Which okay. is weird. A bunch of people die. Um, eh, yeah, then there anyway. is <laughs> the narrative of Zampano as told through a combination of the the Navidson record, which we're reading Zampano's description of, and edited by a young man who found all of Zampano's papers named Johnny Truant. My friend Quay was made for Philadelphia. He knew the streets like he knew the veins on the back of his own hand. Veins which he frequently used for drugs. Cool drugs, like that melancholy kind of hipster shit that you can do over and over in excessive amounts, and the only consequence is that sometimes the girl you went to bed with isn't there in the morning, and that makes you sad. But after all, isn't that what life is? A series of beds that become progressively more empty as the sun rises? I'm getting off topic. Quay called me one night. He had a neighbor who was really into this podcast called Words About Books. I didn't read books. I I didn't even want to want to read books. I I asked him why any of this mattered. And he took that to mean why did a man liking a podcast called Words About Books matter? I of course meant why did anything matter, you know, like on a universal scale. Anyway, Quay said that he knew I was into obscure lost media. And his deaf neighbor had spent the last 75 years constructing an elaborate manuscript for a book reviewing the final episode of the podcast, Words About Books. And what's crazier is that this episode of Words About Books never existed. Supposedly, according to Quay's old neighbor, this podcast did a world-changing episode on a book called House of Leaves, which does exist. Um, it's about a it's about a blind guy writing an analysis of a movie that doesn't exist. So, needless to say, my interest was piqued. Now, I don't roll quite as hard as Quay does, but even I needed to take the edge off this time. Something about what he said shook me all the way down to my tailbone. I took a straw, a paper towel and an entire unopened bottle of Flintstone's chewable vitamins down from my cabinet. I began smashing the beloved childhood characters into a fine powder. Red Freds, Orange Willemas, Purple Dinos, Red Barneys, Purple Bettys. And now, because I really needed this, I even crushed the Orange Bam Bams and Red Pebbles. Do you ever wonder what the colors mean? Why, why are there three reds, two oranges, and two purples? Why is, why is Betty purple, but no other human is purple? 
One by one, their ashes fell into a neat pile on my paper towel. I tipped it all carefully into the straw which I had plugged so that it would act as a sort of pixie stick for my tragic habit. And then I sucked, oh, I sucked that flavorless powder of vitamin A and ascorbic acid all the way to Quays. Johnny Truant represents, I think, the third main narrative. Yeah, unfortunately. Johnny is essentially going mad while reading the Navidson record as written by Zampano. And it's hinted that whatever might be inside the house came for Zampano, and now it's coming for Johnny. It's also hinted that maybe none of this ever existed. Yeah, is exactly. In it's entirely a fabrication of Johnny Truant's imagination. It's also hinted that some of it ha- happened or like... You can you can go in a lot of different directions with this. I've seen people musing that, like, was there a whole reality where the Navidson record did exist and Zampano is the only one that remembers? And it, it's like you're missing the point, That's, I think. Yeah, yeah. Because the point is you're you're reading a book about a guy reading a book about a movie that never existed about a labyrinth. And while you're reading this book, there are footnotes – and marginalia and distractions you're, and references to Yeah, you're being index. led down dead ends that terminate in a nowhere. Yeah. There's a side hall over there. What do we do if we go down this footnote? Oh, it's another story from Johnny. Let's get back to the main story. Oh, but now there's a thing from Zampano. There's a lot of, yeah. uh, a lot of distractions in there. In order to understand, really and truly understand... The Words About Books podcast, we first have to take a deep dive into the meanings of those words. What is a words? Am I saying words right now? Is <coughs> a word? Is French the language of love or a language of words? Second, what is is a podcast. Ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs, see footnote 17, as well as appendix III-C, depict men throwing plant pods into the Nile River, casting pods, as it were. Is that what Words About Books does? Do they cast pods into a river? One pod even contained baby Moses, according to Exodus Roman numeral I.I. Does words about books put babies in pods and cast them into a river? The book itself forces you to like turn it on its side to read upside down text, uh, deals with different languages. There's different colored fonts. There's different fonts. There's different... Um, like the anytime a minotaur is talked about there's a red text with a strike through because zampano was trying to remove the minotaur for whatever reason you can go as far down that path as you want there there's just so many different narratives within the book but if you think about it what i think daniel lusky was trying to do was construct a meta narrative where you're a person reading this book and you're trying to extract some meaning from it to get out of the labyrinth of the book. But eventually you, you realize the only way out of the labyrinth of the book is to just put it down. Mission accomplished, by the way. If I could back that up a little bit, I want to read one more quote. You would. And then we're going to start talking about it. But this is just where I'm drawing my interpretation of the book from pretty heavily. If the work demanded by any labyrinth means penetrating or escaping it, the question of process becomes extremely relevant. For instance, one way out of any maze is to simply put one hand on a wall and walk in one direction. Eventually, the exit will be found. Unfortunately, where the house is concerned, this approach would probably require an infinite amount of time and resources. It cannot be forgotten that the problem posed by exhaustion 
a result of labor, is an inextricable part of any encounter with a sophisticated maze. In order to escape, then, we have to remember we cannot ponder all paths, but must decode only those necessary to get out. We must be quick and anything but exhaustive. Yet, as Seneca warned in his Epistule Morales, 44, going too fast, also incurs certain risks. Unfortunately, the anfractuosity of some labyrinths may actually prohibit a permanent solution. More confounding still, its complexity may exceed the imagination of even the designer. Therefore, anyone within must recognize that no one, not even a god or an other, comprehends the entire maze. And so, therefore, can never offer a definitive answer. Navitson's house seems a perfect example. Due to the wall shifts and extraordinary size, any way out remains singular and applicable only to those on that path at that particular time. All solutions, then, are necessarily personal. That's a quote. That's what should be on the back of the book. That would get far less people reading, but that's a much more accurate experience of what it's like to read. Yeah, yeah, they would just go, oh, okay, I guess, guess I'm good. But this is where the book itself talks about mazes. This is not the only part where the book itself talks about mazes. To me, what the author is telling me there is that this book sort of shifts and changes, and there is so much open to interpretation. There is so much here. There are so many layers of meaning. Pick your own path and find your own way out. Yes, my, my path was going, all right, I'm done. In this case, I feel the extra 500 pages are justified to make his point. Because he's saying you don't have to read it cover to cover one word after another. In fact, you can't. He makes it impossible to do that. You, you, you have to choose between reading Zampano's text and reading Johnny Truant's text. And going into the appendices. And what's Johnny's mom up to? Oh, decode this letter that is uh, unimportant because it's not real. <laughs> Quaid told me that the old man had died, and that while they were cleaning out the place, Quaid had been able to sneak in and snatch a trunk. The trunk, unfortunately, was not filled with cool drugs, but was filled with papers and screenshots of waveforms. I felt something when I looked at those patterns. I felt like I could see the ums and ahs in the wave, the sharp spikes of laughter going on so long that it must have crossed the line from authenticity into annoying. I asked Quay to show me the apartment. Bjorgensen had blocked up every crack, every window. From his writings, I learned that his process required that he be able to smell his own farts as clearly as possible. The walls themselves were covered in crudely drawn pornography, stick figures with large breasts. This also resonated with me, but what frightened me the most was the giant footprint stomped through the hardwood floor next to the spot where Bjorgensen had died. That's when Quay told me there was a party down the road, past the hoagie stand. I went, of course, and that's where I met Blarby. Turns out she knew old man Bjork, too. She was part of a volunteer program at her school that would listen to podcasts that were too lazy to create transcripts and write them down for the hearing impaired. Bjork only requested women. He said their handwriting was better, had a certain beautiful flow to it, and I must say I agree. Several Cherry Coke Zeros later, Blarby and I were rolling around on the floor, clothes flying in every direction. I must have been buzzing from the Coke Zeros because I got a little woozy when my shirt came off. I must have passed out. I woke up the next morning, naked in a stranger's living room, being photographed by said stranger. He said it was for an art project he was working on. I never saw Blarby or my wallet again. I did later receive a text informing me that a black-and-white portrait entitled Sad Man, Sad Penis 
had won a local competition. Well, what I'm talking about more is like the pages where Zampano's text goes on to the next page, but Johnny's text goes on to the next page. Yeah. And so if you start reading the footnote, if you want to finish reading the footnote, you have to turn the page before you finished reading the text on that page. And so you're, you're already choosing paths. I still feel like this didn't require 800 pages to, to make that point, though. You could make it more succinct and still make that point. You could, but the book itself is a labyrinth. It's not meant to be read in its entirety. Yeah, I, I, it's more of an art project yes, than, it absolutely. Is a, than it is a narrative or a, or a yeah, yeah. It's, no, absolutely. That's what it is. It's an art project. We're in the unfortunate position of being book podcasters who want to know what we're talking about. And so I think <laughs> we both had to read longer than we would have read. Oh, if... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. I would have put it down sooner, probably. But I, I would have put it down sooner and felt satisfied with what I got. I would have put it down thinking, yeah, I, I get what you're going for. It, uh, it works. It's it's a neat little thing. And I'd have moved on with my life. But because I'm doing this podcast and I had <laughs> to read so goddamn much of it, I I had to choose a path that was not my personal path. I I had to choose the completionist route that I did not want to take. And so it, it embittered me towards the book ever so slightly. <laughs> yeah, every time I every time I came up to Hey, it's me, Johnny, again. Let me tell you about my latest sexual exploit. I just wanted to go, <laughs> no, thank you. I think, I think I get the gist of it. You got hopped up on something, and something weird happened in bed. I'm just going to skip ahead like four pages now, and I didn't do that. I needed to know for the podcast, Ben. <laughs> it's a common misconception that this is what a podcast is. It appears that it's more of some sort of radio show, except over the internet. Sorry, my dog accidentally ate the script here, so I can't tell you anymore. But I can tell you that podcasts travel over the internet? What is the internet? Former United States Alaskan Senator Ted Stevens said that the internet is not a big truck. It's a series of tubes. So the casters of pods over at Words About Books studio make some sort of radio show, put it in a pod or possibly a child, and then that child into a pod, and then cast it into the internet tubes to be delivered to computers worldwide. So finally, that leaves us with one more question to answer. What are books? Are audiobooks books? Are stone tablets books? Is a Kindle Fire a books? Wait, sorry, that last paragraph on books is stupid. Throw it out, but keep it in the script and see if you can derive meaning from it. So, where, where do you want to go with this? I think I could start with uh, why I picked the book and then okay. what I expected the book to be. You want you want to do that? Yeah. Are you still on Slack? I yeah, I think. Okay. So you don't have to watch this now, but uh here here's the person who recommended it to me, Ben. Get fucked. Why? <laughs> <sighs> You know I wouldn't have read this. I know. And I wish I would have told you because then you would have you would have talked me out of it. Somebody please explain to me what the fuck is the point of Austin McConnell. <laughs> I gonna, don't get he's this gonna make guy a movie, at ben. all. He's gonna... He probably will. I, I just don't get him at all. <laughs> it's just watching a boring guy do boring shit. And he's bad at it. And, well, he, and like that's the point though? Well, well this time. He's, he's talking about House of Leaves, and he's trying to make it out to be like a spooky thing, Ben, where a guy finds a manuscript of a guy who, who mysteriously disappeared, but there was clearly a violent struggle in his apartment, and the manuscript talks about a, a movie, but the movie doesn't exist, Ben, and also 
even if it did, the guy is blind. How could he have seen it, Ben? And I figured, oh my god, so we're going to figure out that the movie had some sort of impact on that guy, and now it's going to affect our drug guy, and we're going to we're going to solve some sort of mystery within a mystery within a mystery. And there's all this zany stuff going on. It's, it's going to linger with you. And no, no, uh, like you said, it's a labyrinth. It's an interesting way of engaging someone in the meta narrative of the narrative itself. I, I but, don't think it's, <laughs> it's not, it's not a horror. No, no, I just I wouldn't classify I think it, is. it as that. I would. I would and I did, actually. I, I think it is. So apparently Stephen King and Joe Hill, who is Stephen King's son, were sitting around talking about something with an interviewer, and the question came up, what do you think the Moby Dick of horror is? And they said this book. And I agree with that, in that I also think Moby Dick is overrated. <laughs> um, <laughs> but... <laughs> my my point is, I do think it is horror. I do think it disorients and makes you uncomfortable. And wow, that that I, I that do. would be news to me. <laughs> uh, and the Johnny Truant parts don't. <laughs> no, Johnny. Okay, so Johnny is a is a tattoo artist who does a lot of drugs, or at least he does drugs from the perspective of someone who maybe never has done drugs. Um, and he has a <laughs> lot of sexual exploits that he goes into graphic detail about. And th- my, th- my thing about this is, yeah, there's horror in it. Yeah, there's uncomfortableness. But every time it seems to get to that high point of, oh, something's going to happen, you either get a... Anyway, the other day, a girl stuck her thumb up my butthole. Ha ha, I was also high on heroin. Or you get Oh, a, no, he never does what, heroin. Whatever. <laughs> y- you, you either get that or you get Zampano going, Now, let me tell you what we're supposed to be feeling in this. Anyway, the other day, I was talking to another one of Bjorkinson's transcription girls. When she got me liquored up on Bud Light Limes and started finger blasting my asshole. She spoke a dozen languages, and during the entirety of our admittedly awkward lovemaking, she was shouting, Baisez-vous, pièce de merde! Which, she later told me, meant, I want you forever and always. I needed that. It's been a long time since anybody wanted me. I didn't learn anything about Bjorgensen or words about books that day. But I did learn something about myself. Every time there is tension, it was immediately relieved by going down one of those side passages of the labyrinth. Where it was like, okay, well, I guess I don't really care about those people being trapped inside the Navidson home. And eventually you start thinking, well, maybe Zampano doesn't exist. The Navidson record didn't exist. It's all Johnny's imagination. Why do I care? I don't like Johnny. I don't really care what happens to Johnny. I care even less about these imaginary people then that he's making up to cope with the existence of a schizophrenic drug addict. I didn't get what I signed up for, or I thought I was signing up for, Ben. (laughs) Austin McConnell lied to me, and I want my money back, which is zero dollars, but I want it back. Shocking. But there is a way to describe this book. Pretentious. That that makes it sound much more traditionally interesting than it is. I would say the disorienting discomfort part comes from the constant shifting of your suspension of disbelief. It intends to play with the contract between writer and audience. Well, well, we signed the contract, okay? You can't play with it after we signed it, okay? <laughs> That's not how this works. In my mind, the reason this isn't as impactful to me, this is not the first time I've encountered this. When, when you're in horror, there is a constant, um, there's a constant appeal of finding something real that's like the whole found footage genre of horror and and i'm thinking back to like cannibal holocaust 
Cannibal Holocaust is a movie that was hyper violent. They they killed animals on set. Is that a B movie? It's a it's an Italian giallo film. Ah, uh, okay. It's one of the goriest movies like to this day in that they did kill animals on set, which uh you're not not supposed to do and um a lot of the actors describe it as being one of the worst experiences of their lives and they were kind of afraid they were participating in a snuff film like actors started bringing their passports with them to set because (laughs) they didn't know if they'd have to make a run for it wow so at the end of the movie most of the characters die and the footage is supposedly found by a third party and they had in their contracts that they had to like disappear for a year oh so that it they could believably say that this was found footage and then it wound up going to court it didn't go to court for murder that's a bit of a rumor it went to court for like obscenity and i don't know none of the actors had now, a good time they now is this a about. is this a movie that was like good on screen or is it more interesting because of all the weird shit behind the scenes it's legit if if you're into gore, which I am not, by the way, no. then yes, it's a legitimately good movie. As ter- in terms of story, th- not really. There's no story. They th- these these white kids go into the jungle and they find natives who uh, tear them apart and eat them. That's that's oh. the story. Okay, but I bring it up because that's one of those experiences where they intended to market it on the thrill. That perhaps you were actually seeing found footage, which would make it a snuff film, which you wouldn't want to see, I hope. Right. (laughs) But there's also, so that was in the 70s when they did Cannibal Holocaust. And there have been millions of found footage movies ever since. Then there have been, in the age of the internet, all these alternate reality games where people will create social media accounts, sometimes years in advance, and lay down the groundwork for these stories what are we doing, by the way? For our next story, have we have we got our groundwork laid out? <laughs> we got ready? God, I hate words about books. I mean, I only do this because I want, I want people to like me. God, every time, every time I forget to turn my mic on, it's me again. Svaldrick Borgensen. This is session number two of our two session series on whatever it is I'm talking about. I thought about going back and removing my fuck ups, but well, that sounds like a job for an editor of some kind. I'm just gonna ramble on my train of thought and you're going to filter it through your brain hole. So where was I talking? Where was I? Where am I? Who am I? I don't know. But let's talk about Benjamin, quote, Ben Edward. What's his backstory in all of this? Ben is a man surrounded in mystery inside of a box marked with a question mark, surrounded by an enigma, wrapped inside another mystery. So his life was written by J.J. Abrams. Ha ha ha. J.J. Abrams is just a figment of your imagination. Not much is known about Ben's early life, other than he had a well, orange rivers, and siblings to bully. Ben's big break came when he realized... I'm doing this in one take. (laughs) Ben's big break came... Ben's big break came when he released the wildly acclaimed best-selling novel, Edenverse. Overnight, Ben had more attention and money than he could ever dream of. Don't read it, he said in several interviews that came out around the time of Edenverse's release. It's really, really bad, he was reported saying to anyone who would listen. But people did read it. People would stop Ben on the street to take their picture with him or ask for signed autographs. It was too much for him to handle. He started having panic attacks, said Ben's wife, first name Ben's, 
last name wife. He just couldn't escape Eden's bullshit. Sometime in 2009, Ben started words about books with Nate. His motivation was to force people to talk with him about Dune. But his real motivation made it Ben so he could do something different from writing Eden First Volume 2. I'm not going to finish A Song of Fire and Ice. Svaldrick means A Song of Ice and Fire. Until Ben releases Eden vs. Volume 2, said George R. R. Martin, a man looked up to and later down upon. All the pressure must have forced Ben... I lost my train of thought. You can, f you can fill in the blanks, though, I'm sure. So this is why Ben has such low energy. He hasn't been able to feel joy since the release of Edenverse. Only mild amusement at best. His pain is different from Nate's, and that- Oh shit, I spilled coffee all over my script- Oh, oh, god! <clears throat> oh, I'm such a- such a dumbass. Uh, well, the script ends with, uh, some about Ben's douche philosophy corner, um, lot of red words here have been crossed out uh, and there's also a star with nine points and a spiral in the middle I tried to get a hot girl to draw it to my exact specifications but I'm blind Svaldra forgot that he's supposed to be deaf not blind and I don't know if she actually drew it properly I tried to draw it myself but my hands are actually made of gingerbread so figure that one out, guys. And remember, I'm a fremda spraka zu sprechen mach schlau. Like, I have seen these accounts where, like, they'll use unlisted videos on YouTube, they'll hide things in the source code of the web pages. like, you will have to go all over the internet, you can maybe even, like, find something based on a geocaching thing and go out and dig it up in reality there's there's a lot of immersive storytelling art projects out there especially in the age of the internet and for me unfortunately the novelty of having to turn the book to its side because you printed the text upside down <laughs> just doesn't cut it anymore how about the fact that house is blue even in other languages? Did that do it for you? No, I don't care. It, it's... I, I saw... Uh, I just want to bring this up. There was someone who was... They were hunting for clues, Ben. They got the book in like four different languages. Do they think Daniel Lewski was like intimately involved <laughs> in, in the each language? Yes. Like, do they, do, does he think Daniel Lewski speaks those languages well enough to do that? Yeah, I've read his book. He speaks great French. I think that's what he mostly uses, right? Yeah. He's got yeah. all those French phrases. Amazing. Yeah, he, he's got French and some German, and that's and, about it. And maybe maybe <laughs> Czech. I don't know. The only way we can find out is if we buy it in Czech, Ben. My point Czech is... Czech the Czech. My point is, I get what he was going for. This novel was published in 2000, kind of before I think a lot of people knew about all the internet stuff going on but it's not a super original idea to make the medium part of the message to force active engagement instead of passive engagement to increase the horror or mystery or whatever of your story like i'll tell you decoding the mom's letters even though it's the world's most simple cipher where it's the first letter of each word is what you use and the, the words themselves are gibberish. Yeah. And that's part of the problem is like, <gasps> I don't mean to say it's lazy. It's not lazy. It's just not as smart as it wants to be. There was, there was a, a, a footnote later that had a bunch of just tons and tons and tons of citations. Someone took the first letter of every single one of those and it turned out to be gibberish, but in some places, you could make out a few words if you add some O's in there. Well, I, I do chuckle at the parts where it is purposely gibberish to, like, force you to spin your wheels 
And eventually you may find a pattern in the static and that could send you down an entirely alternate path. That's part of my problem though, is to me, it seems like he's actively encouraging you not to take that bait. Unless you're a super smart guy. You you analyze all the clues in your cryptography lab beneath the bat cave. If you take the time to solve the mom's letter, it is creepier than if you just read the letter. And then, of course, later on, they say, by the way, none of that ever happened. Yeah, by the way, she has schizophrenia. And so all of that was like her having a break. <laughs> there are more interesting mysteries like... How how did Karen take an SSRI in the 80s when they didn't exist? Or the 70s, I think, is probably when she took it. There's a more interesting connection between, like, Johnny and his mom and the characters in the Navidson record and Zampano. And this is, like, I have my own private theory that Johnny made it all up. Because he's a storyteller. He likes to make out long-winded stories. And, oh, yeah, most of the people, the characters... They all uh they all sound an awful lot like Johnny. It's all written in one voice pretty much, which you yeah. can say is intentional, I suppose. What's his what's his excuse for misspelling a lot though? It's A space L O T. Not A L O T. I don't know, man. He also That's says right. shouldn't have instead of shouldn't have. Oh my god. Let's decode it, Ben. I Why is there an X <laughs> over this letter, Ben? I don't know, but maybe if we analyze it in four different languages, we'll find the pattern, and that will unlock another mystery that will unlock another mystery. It's like you said, it's like the J.J. Abrams mystery box, except in this case, there doesn't have to be a conclusion that lets everyone down. It's open-ended. I don't know if that's an improvement or not. I just want to say, I, I have private theories about a lot of this like we can get into that if you want because i put in the work if anybody wants to yell at me about well you don't get it because you just didn't try i've listened to his sister's stupid album five times (laughs) oh my god i i just sat there at work playing it on loop one day (sighs) and there to me the navidson record seems a lot like uh daniel lewski talking about his own family where did he have a better uh, a more successful awesome twin <laughs> his sister <laughs> could be his um the daughter he could be the son oh his, i see what you did there the mother could be his mother now there's also similarities between karen and the navidson record and johnny truant's mother there's possible connection between Johnny Truant's mother and Zampano, they both use some of the same French phrases. They, um, they both eat French fries. <laughs> <laughs> There's another problem, though, of Johnny Truant is an extremely unreliable narrator. Yup. Zampano is blind, and I think I read that in an interview, Daniel Lewski said that the inspiration for that was the blind poets of old. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something, Ben. Are you ready? Uh-huh. Uh... <laughs> uh, yeah, I agree. And Zampano has this never ending list of attractive young women who read to him because he was blind. And Johnny meets each and every one of those and, and has sex, sex with each and every one of them. Except, no, not one of them. She said, I'm not going to have sex with you but you could jerk off on me? And then she stuck her thumb right in his butthole. That did happen. Thanks, book. That was something I needed to know about. That enriched my understanding. There's a lady with Pac-Man boobs. I remember that. Would you des- would you describe that as beautifully told, a la the New York Times book review? <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's... Perfect. I, 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 I question how much those people read. Did they stop at some point, and what point was that? This book is taught in colleges. I'm sure it is. It comes off as a literature jerk-off. A circle jerk, if you would. (laughs) It comes off as the worst part of 
literature. Not maybe not exactly the book, but the the super uber hardcore fans who again, it's okay to like the book. I'm not going to bash you for liking the book. You can like whatever the fuck you want. It's the people who then go on and proclaim that they are superior somehow because they read it and they understood it and you didn't. And then they start farting and smelling their own farts. That is, that's the type of person I'm like, maybe, maybe you need to like get another hobby or something. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you're the problem. Nathaniel Creed. Who is Nathaniel Creed? Or Nate? A failed English major and bookman turned successful medical professional. Nate entered college with high hopes of becoming an author. As everyone knows, the best way to become an author is through a college course in writing. Without a degree in English, you're basically not even an author. On David Letterman, Nate explains that there's a word missing here in my script, but I'm not going to edit it. Nate explains that left the field when he got a particularly pretentious English course that had no rubric, but still graded against him. At the same time, he went to a writer's group that was led by grad students who hadn't even published anything other than really cringy poetry. But is that really the truth? <gasps> he shares a similar story with the New York Times in an article entitled, A Man Prints Out a Hundred Copies of His Own Book and Then Chads Them in Half. You'll Never Guess What Happens Next. A story about Nate's battles with his own book, Eveverse. In that article, Nate says the same thing he said on Letterman, but he interestingly leaves out the part with the cringy poetry. A clue, perhaps? Nate has also extensively... Nate has also talked extensively about the English creative writers smelling their own farts, loudly discussing how awesome their new scripts were in a Panera, and how intelligent they were. But was that just the ravings of a man who didn't make it? It's no secret that his magnum opus, Edenverse, was a failure. In an interview with Nintendo Power Magazine, Nate mentions that the sales of Edenverse were, quote, disappointing to say the least. He also tells Miyamoto that if he could do it over again, quote, I'd write a better book and also work on having more talent. According to the text, Miyamoto nods in agreement to this statement. Quote, Nate's relationship with books is very complex, his wife would say years later in an interview. Quote, I can't say much more about it because our wedding license had a really specific NDA about the subject. So what was his complicated relationship with books? Why would he go into English only to leave and go into healthcare? Why would he write a book that was critically panned and sold even worse? One anonymous source may have the answer. I'm gonna have to edit this part. Books tried to take the life of his son, the source says. Nate couldn't handle that. Something in him snapped that day. He went into English in order to create books as only a book can defeat a book, or so he thought. When he failed at that, and failed to write a substantial book, he pivoted into healthcare. He pursued psychology in order to understand books. You have to know your enemy to defeat your enemy. It explains a lot. Why Nate doesn't like reading, why he has a book podcast, why he's in psychology, it's even clear that Nate uses humor in his podcast to hide his dark pain, this aching in his soul. Every time he laughs, you have to wonder just how much hurt he's hiding underneath. It's kind of Twilight for lit majors because it allows you to endlessly insert your own narrative. And then, and then the book will stick itself in your butthole. Is that? And, 
instead of Bella being like a self insert for whatever girl happens to be reading Twilight, this is like a self insert for whatever <laughs> aspiring young writer happens to be reading. <laughs> you can you can interpret like and I'm not saying it's not even fun to think about. I I do think there is some interesting stuff going on. Like it all depends on how much information you choose to accept is reality. And that's where I think how much work are you willing to put into it, Ben? It's not going to hold your hand and wipe your ass. I do disagree with that phrasing. I don't think this book is too smart for anyone. I think it's just how much how interested are you in the idea of multiple levels of reality? I accidentally took a double dose of my amoxicillin. Found myself receiving a disinterested hand job from another of Bjorg's transcribers. She told me that Bjorgensen was obsessed with layers of reality. Like when you dream about other people, it can feel like you're interacting with someone. But in actual reality, it's all in your head. You're you, and you're also them. The whole dream is you. And how do we know that this reality isn't just a dream within a dream? Within a dream. I've been struggling to keep it all straight. Bjorgensen's notes, the podcast, the book, the editors of Johnny's editing of Zampano's notes about a movie that doesn't exist. Sometimes I shake my head and realize that I've been staring at a wall for the past three days. I've started hearing the podcast, even when I'm not wearing headphones. I hear Ben's voice say, Don't forget to check us out at WAB Pod. Check us out on Instagram at Words About Books Podcast. Then there's the blog at blog.wordsaboutbooks.ninja. Their mention of the email address has been inconsistent. Sometimes it's wordsaboutbookspodcast at gmail.com. Other times it's wordsaboutbookspod at gmail.com. And whatever you do, for the love of God, don't forget to buy them a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash wabpod. I can tell that the voices aren't done with me yet. The words about books coverage of House of Leaves was actually a two-parter. I don't know if my sanity will last. Sammen, se, sæg, nå, men.